Good morning, everybody. It's a great honor to have our distinguished guest, Professor Tim Yi, here, and it's my great pleasure to introduce him to you. Yeah, Professor Kim is an economist from Kingston University, United Kingdom. He has a strong background in mathematics and uh, uh, system science. So this is the reason why we invite him to come to our school. He will present you a short course uh, during his day and give a, a series of lectures for different groups. I, I think that you have no more about him from research and uh, other sources. He, here, I would like to let you know more about his personal characters. I guess most of you may often face a big and difficult question about how to make a decision of your own career. This is very hard for us, mm, yeah, for is. many students. So I think the answer for me is that thing, start to do the right thing for you. So what is the right thing for you? Then I would say that uh, Stephen King has done his right thing yes. when he was at, uh, at your current age. <clears throat> he chosen mathematics and then economics he, uh, when he was young. He chose, chose the comes as the goal of his life. And because, not because it is beautiful, not because it is powerful, but because he believed that he can make it beautiful and powerful. I revere him as a prophet in the community of economics for the crucial future of economics. At a very earlier time, he recognized that the mainstream economics this was on the right, wrong track. And he believed strongly believed that this old building <coughs> will fall down someday. <coughs> Sorry. Then he wrote a book entitled Debunking in Economics to tell us why the prevailing paradigm of economic theory is wrong. He also, he also foresaw the new economic building of, of economics to be set up sooner or later. He devoted himself into constructing the new one. However, what the new one looks like, you may may be curious about it. They, they has addressed this issue in his blog set of depth words, the code. So you can find many promising achievements in his website. I admire him for his one hero in the circle of new economics. He has been fighting against the whole company of economics by his side for maybe several decades. Mm. And, and he even challenged the Nobel Prize winner for Krugman. And I, I can remember clearly how excited I was. And, and then I followed the whole process of debate. Wow. And finally okay. witnessed his victory in debate. Oh, well, all yeah. would disagree, but of in course he always does. In 2012. <laughs> it must be a victory, even and a milestone in the role of the recipient country. Is in this dense course, he will demonstrate how he sees the real kind of world with his remarkable perspective, especially with my thoughts from complex science. I believe you will enjoy the wonderful journey that will lead us during this week. Today, I will start from the showcase of failures of traditional economics. Let's welcome him. Hi, Steve. I beg you to uh, speak as slowly as you can. I'll try. So I'll try. Most of us can follow you. And, and thank you for a wonderful introduction. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as I was explaining to you, Guy, uh, when he first invited me, I have made three trips. This is my third trip to China this year. But it's my fourth trip in 32 years. The previous time I was here in China, was in 1980, 81, 82, so before most of you were born. And believe me, China is a radically different and, and better society, better country now than it was then. Uh, remarkable to see the changes. So it's been a pleasure for me to experience China after that huge gap. And then to be invited to, to give you a, a talk about what economics is and what I think it should be. 
Um, tell me by that, please, if, if I do speak too quickly, just do this, okay? Am I okay at the moment? Reasonable? Okay, okay. Um, the one thing I saw happening when you had the transition from the socialist, strongly socialist regime under Mao and then what was called the Gang of Four. Has anybody heard that expression with the English? Can you translate for me? <laughs> okay. To the um, Western uh, a, a market economy, what I saw happening at the same time was that a lot of Chinese academics switched from teaching Marx to teaching Samuelson. Okay, and I thought, oh no, from one mistake to another. Okay. <laughs> I, I see there's far more of merit in Marx than in, than in, than in Samuelson, but the wrong, a, a, a very stylized, um, stereotype typical version of Marx was being taught here, and you went across to a very stylized, stereotypical version of economics as well. It wasn't the right, it wasn't why the West had succeeded. Okay? In fact, the ex explanations why the West succeeded as an industrial um, force really was in economists that had been ignored by people like Samuelson. And so I was delighted to meet Yugi and um, find that when it was in Shanghai, to find that there was now a strong interest, certainly amongst this group, in a new uh, non equilibrium approach to economics. So, what I'm going to be talking about is that approach. To give you a rough outline, I'm going to give four lectures. The, the entire first lecture is on why the neoclassical, neoclassical paradigm failed. Second lecture, I'm going to take a break from all the economics and take you through using Minsky, the software package I've developed with the help of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And then also uh, part of its funding was also covered by a crowdfunding group called Kickstarter. So, but it's very new software, so I have to take it. It has bugs, okay? <laughs> It's going to crash, I can guarantee it. For you, I'm going to get you to use it tomorrow. It'll probably errors, but it's worth learning. Then I'll talk about Hyman Minsky and what's called the financial instability hypothesis in the third lecture. And then in the fourth, I'll talk about the importance of the endogeneity of money and how that changes macroeconomics. So that's that's the basic outline of what I'll be covering. In today's lecture, I'm going to just talk, talk on that failure of the neoclassical paradigm. <coughs> So a look at neoclassical economics before the crisis occurred, when the neoclassical school was incredibly dominant, probably more dominant than it's been probably in history. And what happened in, in, in mainstream economics from about 1970 through to 2007 was redesigning economics to use what they call micro foundations. So that's trying to derive macroeconomics from micro. Okay. And there's two strands here. There's the pure strand, which, you call, which, which is called New Classical by the people who practice it, and it's nicknamed Freshwater by the people who don't like it. Okay. Then there's what they call, uh, what, what you can see in New Classical adding frictions to it, which is New Keynesian and called Saltwater. Um, and then I'll talk about the, the nature of the, how they felt about their own economics prior to the economic crisis. Then after the crisis, it's in shock. And I think that's a very appropriate way to describe the neoclassical school, as well as focusing, explaining everything by shocks. They're now in shock themselves. And what they're trying to do to cope with it is to introduce what they call financial frictions into the basic model that they use. Um, and the only advice they can give and I, I, you, you told me yesterday, am I pronouncing your name properly, by the way? Yugi? Is that? No. Okay. Uh, told me yesterday you use Blanchard as a textbook. Is that correct? Okay. I'm going to be making lots of quotes from Blanchard by sheer accident. That's the person I chose to focus on. So I'm going to take you back right now, back to the beginning of macroeconomics. And in an essential sense, there was no macroeconomics before the 1930s. Um, instead, you had an acceptance of what's called Say's Law. Now, pardon me, am, is my pace still okay? Good, okay. Just interrupt me if I go too quickly. I tend to speed up. Okay. 
And that was the argument that aggregate demand was determined by aggregate supply. In effect, there is no difference between the two. Um, a colleague of mine uh, that I disagree with fundamentally on economics, but have great respect for, for his openness, a guy called Stephen Cates, another Australian, uh, he just basically says aggregate demand is aggregate supply. They are the same thing. Okay. And this is quoting from Ricardo, going back to the days of classical economics. So, Monsieur Say has, however, most satisfactorily shown, that's the old English spelling of the word shown, with an E, that there is no amount of capital which may not be employed in a country because demand is limited only by production. In other words, source of demand is production itself. And here's a quote which where, where, where Ricardo is paraphrasing Say. He says, no man produces but with a view to consume or sell. And he never sells but with an intention to purchase some other commodity. So the whole purpose of, of selling something is to buy something else. Okay? Um, which is then notice which may be immediately useful to him or contribute to future production. So you're either buying to consume or to invest. Okay? You simply sell so that you can consume or invest. That's the attitude. And therefore, by producing, you necessarily become either a consumer of what you produce yourself, so you produce for your own consumption, or you purchase or consume goods from someone else. So the two are always in balance. Okay? That's, that's the argument that you find in Ricardo from the principles back in, I think, 1817. And within that, there was an allowance that there could be shortages or surpluses in individual markets, but the aggregate insufficiency was impossible. You could not have aggregate demand less than aggregate supply. Okay? So any explanation for why there was a shortage in one market had to be something about prices being wrong. So here again, this is now, I think I've got uh, Say coming up here. And so he's arguing that you can have too much of a particular commodity produced, so there can be a glut, and that could be, for example, labour being in glut, okay? But the explanation was labor's price is too high. So you drop the price of labor and you will get full employment. And so he's saying it cannot be the case that there can be inadequate demand for all commodities. So the demand, and this is definitely say, the demand for corn is limited by the mouths which are to eat it, for the shoes and coats by the persons who are to wear them. He said that though a community may have as much corn and as many hats as it may wish to consume, the same can't be true for every individual commodity. So you can have individual shortages and gluts. Actually, that was, in fact, Ricardo still. I, I, I think I can recognise their writing styles, but I think say, say affected Ricardo so much. It read like Say just there. Now, so that argument all the way through is that you can have individual markets that are out of balance, and therefore the solution is that there's too much being produ uh, produced of one particular commodity, so that if all that's produced is not sold, its price has to fall. That's all. Okay? Which is really microeconomics. And what's remarkable about Ricardo accepting this particular approach is that if you think about, if you look at how Ricardo defines value, which is an essential concept in economics that we don't spend enough time on today, Ricardo's definition of value was value reflected the effort involved in production. Whereas Say has the neoclassical attitude that value is the consumer's satisfaction. Okay? Now, strangely enough, even though they had incompatible views of what value was, Ricardo accepted Say on macroeconomics. Then you get the neoclassical school coming along, formed in the 1870s, and they had the same value theory as say. They argue that value is subjective. Okay? The essence of value, according to a neoclassical point of view, is the subjective satisfaction of the consumer. So the value of a chair, to the neoclassical theory, is how comfortable you feel. Okay? The value of a chair, to the classical school, is how much it costs to make. Okay? So there's that difference in, in mindset between the two. But when the neoclassical school comes along, they have the same subjective theory that Say had about value being reflecting sets of utility and a compatible macroeconomics. Again, that it was impossible to have insufficient aggregate demand. And then something happened. 
the Great Depression, which was a huge shock to the not just to the economy but to economics as well. This is a uh, photograph from an Australian newspaper, uh, Australian magazine from that time. Clearly, that person wearing that sign, I seek work. I've tramped thousands of miles for a few odd jobs, but still hoping. He is not voluntarily unemployed. Okay? He did not choose to be in that situation. Uh, now, of course, the argument was that he should be accepting a lower price. He was. Okay? Still was not getting work. Now, you can time the beginning of the Great Depression to a stock market crash. But just before that crash occurred, the, the leading neoclassical economist at the time was Irving Fisher. You all know the name Irving Fisher? Okay. And here is his argument back in that days. He said, stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Okay. In other words, they're very high and they're not going to go down. Now, that's all you normally see of his quote. What he actually said in the newspaper column, he, he was a bit like, uh, he was the Paul Krugman of his day, okay? He wrote in the, in the Wall Street Journal, I think. He said, I do not feel that there will soon, if ever, be a 50 or 60 point break for low present levels, such as Mr. Babson has predicted. Mr. Babson being a bit like Muriel Rubini at the same time. He said, I expect to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months on October 15 of 1929. He lost $12 million okay, <laughs> over the next few years. Like most people who were in, in, invested in the stock market in those days, he had margin loans. Okay. He'd taken out, he had say a million dollars he'd put into the stock market and bought $10 million worth of shares with them. And the collapse in the stock market completely eliminated his wealth. Um, in this, putting it in terms of a, the prices we're used to, in, in 2000 that was worth about $100 million. So we're talking one serious loss of wealth, one serious shock, not just to his views about the world, but also his personal circumstances. Now the crash began eight days after he made that statement. And this is what it looked like. Oh my God, something gone wrong with the video there. That's not supposed to be happening. <laughs> it's supposed to be, each of those is supposed to be showing the segments going down. But this is the, what they call a stick and a candle and stick chart with the, the, the top, the maximum to the bottom range being shown by the, the size of, of those bar, of the, the, the little lines there and the direction of price movement by the, uh, the colors. So you can see there's a big falls in the stock market, huge range, but ultimately going from a point level of about 350 on the 15th of October, which is when he made that statement, and then down, 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 big down, big down, and by the end of the period, it was down 120 points. So he was saying, literally, one week before it started to happen, that there'd be no fall of 50 or 60 points, and over a period of two weeks, there was a fall of 120 points. 30% fall in the index. And it kept on going. Again, I didn't animate that properly, except I'm lucky here. Ah, to change my animations there. That's showing the sort of stock market from uh, back in the, um, I think, 1915 through to 1994. And you can see the scale of the fall across that period. It's showing it in the logs here. And that's the overall index. And you can see that it went from, this is the S&P now, which is not the same as the index I showed in the previous chart, the Dow Jones. That was the peak, 32 points at its peak in 1929 to below five by the time it stopped going down. So it's a much bigger crash than we've seen this time round. And then that was a three year period, but it took 25 years before the index returned to its previous value. So if you'd bought shot shares at the peak, and you bought the index, it looked like it might take a quarter of a century to get your money back. In fact, it took longer because many of the stocks that were in the 1929 index had gone bankrupt by 1949. So in fact, to get your money back, it would have taken 40 or 50 years. And of course, for people like Irving Fisher, he'd lost all his money. And it wasn't just the stock market that crashed as well, of course. 
That's the plot of unemployment and the, and the ch change in GDP over all of those years. So it took 10 years before the output level of 1929 was restored in 1939. Of course, a lot of that was, was well, began, uh, you can see the radical increase after that period really reflects the growth in military spending. This is America, but military spending to supply demand initially from England for weapons during the early part of the Second World War. So even that rise here, you can say, would mean maybe wouldn't have happened for the great, except for the uh, for the Second World War. And the scale of downturns here, this is the, sh the sharpest part of the overall crisis. There's a 30% fall in output over a four-year period. So bigger than we've experienced this time around, except possibly in Europe. And this is now looking at unemployment. So the, rec the recorded level of unemployment simply recorded how many workers had applied for registering themselves as unemployed. And at the beginning of the crisis, it was literally zero. The percentage of the American workforce that was actually registered as unemployed was clo effectively close to zero. As the percentage of the population, zero. It hit 25% three years later. And then notice this period here. It went from 25% unemployment in 1932 down to about 11% in mid-1937. <coughs> and economists, I think, were thinking, oh, we don't know what caused the crisis, but thank God it's over. And then this happened. Unemployment went back up to 20%. Now, a lot of that was because, I will argue this on um, in the third lecture, a lot of this was because Roosevelt had been persuaded to attempt to get the, the budget back into balance again. Because the, the worst was over, that was obvious. Okay? Time to get the budget back in repair again, and this is what happened. Now, Keynes's book came out in 36. And I think Keynes had the impact he had because of this falling back into another depression. Okay? That was very important. Now, World War II comes along, and then you get a sustained recovery, and again, on the same series, the National Bureau of Economic Research series of unemployed, you're back down to zero by 1942, when, of course, most of the people who got those jobs were either making weapons or using them. Now, after that event, neoclassical economists realised they needed macroeconomics. They needed some sort of theory of the aggregate level rather than just having a theory of individual markets. And the best example I can find is actually the one that Hicks put together, John Hicks, when he wrote his classic paper, Mr. Keynes and the Classics. Has anybody here read that paper? Okay. There's some references I recommend reading, and I'll put that list together as we go through the week. But this is one called Mr. Keynes and the Classics, and it's Hicks's interpretation of John Maynard Keynes's general theory of employment, interest and money. I'd also write at the same time, another one I'd recommend you read immediately, is the 1937 paper by Keynes himself called The General Theory of Employment. Okay, So write those two down. Mr Keynes and the Classics by Hicks and The General Theory of Employment by Keynes. Much the same time, they came out at much the same time, they're much the same length, and I want you to compare the two and see whether you think they're the same because Hicks said he was summarising Keynes and Keynes wrote his own summary in 1937. Compare the two. But anyway, in this paper, he said, well, here's a typical way that neoclassical economists thought about macroeconomics implicitly, even though there wasn't uh, an active area called macroeconomics. So they divide the economy into two industries, investment goods, which he signified by X, and consumption goods by Y. Not at all the, the notation we're used to today, but I'm, I'm sticking with his notation here. <clears throat> and there are two factors of production, labor, which you could vary, and capital, which was fixed in the short run machinery. You couldn't order the number of factories in the very short run. And there was a given stock of capital in both industries. An output, in the N for the number of people employed, subscript X for those employed producing investment goods, and subscript Y for those producing consumption goods. That's total output. 
So x, which is the number of uh, the amount of output in, in investment goods, was a function of how many workers were employed producing investment goods. And output in consumption goods was a factor of how many workers were employed in producing consumption goods because you assume capital is fixed. Okay? So the only variable input is labor, and they both have diminishing marginal productivity. So more workers can produce more output, but each worker produces less output than the worker before. So that's the vision. Okay. Am I still going at an okay speed? Good. Okay. Okay. Now prices are equal to marginal cost. Again, this is neoclassical theory. And the marginal cost, the only only thing you're varying is the number of workers. Okay? So your marginal cost is the inverse of the marginal product of labor times the wage rate. Oh, pardon me, is the marginal is, is the marginal product times the wage rate. So you've got marginal cost is the increase in labor, so change in x, dnx and dny, for each increment in output, dx and dy. And the price is therefore the price of the price of the goods, which is price equal to marginal cost. The price of consumer goods is going to be the wage rate, which is common, multiplied by the marginal product of the labour. And the price of Y, the same the same sort of thing. I'll actually, as I'm looking at it, I'm wondering if I got should I have the inverse in there or not? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll check that later. Okay, so income is equal to the value of output, which is price times quantity. So the total income, he showed income for the entire economy is I. These days we tend to use Y. was the value of investment goods <coughs> IX plus the value of consumption goods IY, which is that wage rate times the marginal product. Wage rate times marginal product times how many uh, units of the output are produced. Whereas this is the wage rate times marginal product times how many units of consumption goods are produced. So that's the total value of output in the economy. The quantity of money, money now comes in. Money is a given, money is fixed. Okay? Or money can be varied by the government. And there's a fixed relationship between money and income also measured in terms of money. But money, the money value of the money, money in the economy will be a constant multiplied by the level of output. Okay. It's, it's, it looks strange when you read this paper through. It really is stra a strange theory, and you'll, I'll show you why in a moment. So there's the total value of money, which is a control variable, okay, is this money output ratio equals K, which is the transaction demand for money, multiplied by the number of goods being produced. So demand for the investment goods is a function of the interest rate. The demand, the, the lower the interest rate, the more investment projects are going to have a positive net present value. Okay, so if the interest rate falls, the demand to produce investment goods will rise because more investment projects are going to have a positive net present value. So that's the demand for investment goods. Now the supply, to, to, to get the investment goods in the first place, you have to borrow money. So you have to borrow money from people who've saved and the supply of savings was also a function of the interest rate. So the higher the interest rate, the more people were willing to forego current consumption, put it into savings, therefore it was available to be invested. So they're both seen as functions of the interest rate. And therefore, if you have a high level of savings, if savings actually <coughs> increases, then the, pr the price at which those two curves are going to intersect is going to be lower. Okay? So more savings means more investment. So you draw it this way, you have invest the, uh, I've got, that should be a lowercase i for interest rate there, pardon me. That would be Windows correcting my timing. I couldn't have a lowercase i at the beginning of the sentence. So you have the output investment, the demand is being a downward sloping function of the interest rate. So the lower the interest rate, the higher the level of demand. And then in the supply of savings being an upward sloping function of the interest rate. So the higher the interest rate, the more people saved. And therefore, this point could be moved around if the, if, if people, if the supply curve moved down this way, high supply of savings, interest rate would fall, and therefore demand for investment goods would be higher. So you stimulate the economy that way. So that's what determines the number of workers you hire. So you just drop a line down from there, and you can work out 
given that function, the investment output as a function of how many workers you've hired, you now are changing how many workers work in investment goods to produce that output. So the causal chain is this, and this is where it is strange. The amount of money in the economy determines total output. Now that sounds non-neoclassical to me, okay? but this is the vision that Hick said is how neoclassical economists thought. So amount of money which the government can control determines the amount of output. The interest rate determines the output of investment goods. So we've got M determining total output and, and therefore the, in, the interest rate determining how much of that total output is investment goods. That determines employment producing investment goods, so we've got part of employment worked out now. And the gap between the two determines consumption. In other words, consumption is a residual. Consumption is simply what's not invested. Okay. And then that determines employment in the consumer goods sector. So therefore, so that's, that's, the, that's the causal chain, which is a strange causal chain, even trying to think in a neoclassical way. That looks strange to me. But this is the argument that Hicks put forward. The total output is Ah, uh, yeah, here it's nominal. Um, well, it's, 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 it's physical, pardon me. It's physical, what happens the price level adjusts? Okay, so there's flight price level adjustments going on. So it's a physical level of output. Uh, the M equals K times I. The K times I would give you the, the money value. So the I is real. But obviously what's being seen as happening is all sorts of price adjustments absorbing the change in the amount of money. So what this means is a lower money wage, if you can reduce the money wage, you get higher employment because lower wages, oh actually lower money wage, they also thought meant lower real wage. Okay, so if you have a lower wage, you get lower prices because if you drop the, the money wage and you've got a fixed amount of money, then there's a higher income relative to prices. Okay. So if you have a higher, if you can, if you can drop the wage, workers get paid less. Okay. That, there's still the same amount of money. The money amounts determining total demand. Because goods are now cheaper, there's more demand. And that's the logic they had. That if you have an experience like the Great Depression, if you can reduce wages, okay, you will stimulate demand because the demand is given by the amount of money, which is seen as independent of the money wage. Now, what it looks strange, if you're looking puzzled, it's quite sensible to be puzzled. Do read the original, okay? Two reasons for that. One, to get a feeling for the argument as it's made. Two, don't trust me, okay? Always read the originals where you can in economics. That's one reason I emphasize in debunking it. Can I wait to see a copy of it sitting on your desk there? I'll take a photo with you later on that. So this is what he said was Keynes's general theory, on the other hand, is that money demand is a function not just of the of the level of level of interest rate, but also sorry, not just demand for money was a function of transactions, which is the neoclassical view, but also a function of the rate of interest. And that's what he said was the major change that Keynes brought along, and also the argument that uh, Savings was a function of income, not a function of the interest rate. Now, just to compare that to what he said was the, the classical theory I've just been through, rather than saying money is simply a function of the level of income, okay, here it's a function of the interest rate as well. You still have investment being determined by the interest rate. That hasn't changed. But he's now saying, according to Keynes, savings is a function of income, not a function of the level of the interest rates. Okay. Now that's what gave rise to ISLM analysis. You've all done ISLM at some point? Most of you? Who has not done ISLM, the ISLM model? Hands up with you. Okay, you've all done it, all right. <laughs> okay, so what this led Hicks to derive was this argument for summarizing Keynes. He said there's a, a fixed supply of money a given amount of money in the economy which can be changed by the government, by central bank activity and so on. And there's a demand for money at a particular level of income and that demand for money diminishes as the interest rate rises because the cost of holding money becomes expensive. If you have money in your pocket, okay, it's money you have there rather than goods. 
So you're you're doing without goods to have money. Okay. So the higher the level of interest rate, the um, the bigger that cost. Okay. And the lower demand for money you're going to have. If the interest rate is very low, you're not foregoing a lot by having money in your pocket. So you're likely to have more money demand money. Now, that then means you can now make a mapping between the interest rate and the level of income. Take that across to there and say there's the uh, mapping the interest rate on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal, that's one particular point corresponding to a given level of interest rate and a given level of money supply and a given level of income. Then you consider a higher level of income because you need money for transactions, there will be a higher level of demand for money as well. This gives you a second point with a higher interest rate. Okay, And you keep on going and you can drive an LM curve. So that's the liquidity money part of the theory, the way that Hicks described Keynes's theory. Now the IS curve is slightly more complicated. You start from the idea of investment being a function of the level of interest. So the lower the level of interest, the higher the level of investment that will occur. So investment is a function of the interest rate. Then you have savings. Savings is a function of income. So at a low level of income, there's no savings, but past a certain point of income, people save a positive amount of money. So the higher the level of income, the more savings that occurs. You then have the multiplier effect linking investment to output. So the Keynes's multiplier turns up there. Here's a 45 degree line to link the two. So here's one point on your investment rate and your level of output, and the same uh, level of output determined in the savings function, you choose a lower level of interest rates with a higher level of uh, output as well, you get the IS curve. Okay. This is not the way Paul Krugman derives the argument, it's the way that Hicks derived the argument in the first place. So given all that, you now have ISLM analysis. So you can now draw a map for the economy with the interest rate on the vertical axis and income on the horizontal. And you have the IS and LM curve. We, we call it LM. In that article, Hicks calls it LL. He made up his own notation, obviously. Pardon me. That's your, basic, that's your basic idea. And that is supply and demand curves at the level of macro, economic, macro economy. Okay? It's the same sort of idea as micro. You've just transposed equilibrium in micro to equilibrium in macro. So don't worry about that. Five minutes. Five, five, five minutes. Oh, I see. Five minutes too. Okay. Okay. Now that means that from Hicks's point of view, mm -hmm. Keynes is a neoclassical. He says the income and rate of interest are now determined together, just as price and output are determined together in the modern theory of supply and demand. <coughs> so he's really saying Keynes has taken microeconomics to the level of macro. He said in that case, it's very close to the innovation of the marginalists, and he's talking mainly about Volra and uh, and so on on the on the continent. And so he sees Keynes integrating himself with the classics with the slope of the LM curve. How, how, do you now, how do you now bring the two together? You've got this vision of the economy using supply and demand curves effectively. So how do you integrate the classical view about the economy always being in full employment with Keynes's view that you can have unemployment in equilibrium? Well, he said it's the slope of that money, liquidity money curve. He said it's almost horizontal for low levels of in, the level of interest, and almost vertical for high levels of the rate, rate of uh, high levels of income. So you show it like this: you have a Keynesian and a classical region. So here's the here's the graph overall. There's the LM curve. There's the IS curve. If you're in this area where the LM curve is flat, then Big changes to the level of interest have no imp can't change much. You're stuck in a Keynesian region down here. But if the economy is booming, you're in the classical region. Okay. So he saw it's possible to integrate the two views together. Well, it's a nice theory, but is it Keynes? And of course, Paul Krugman argues that it is. I was actually in, I went to the Rethinking Economics conference in New York. And he was making the same case. This 36 paper summarised Keynes and it's accurate and it's a good theory still. Well, if you look read Keynes, yes, you can find elements that are just like 
what Hex argues, very, very similar. But you can also find arguments like this, and this is Keynes saying he accused the classical economic theory of being one of those pretty polite techniques which tries to deal with the present by abstracting from the fact that we know very little about the future. Okay. Now, that's saying that expectations of the future are important. What Hicks has, on the other hand, there's no uncertainty. There's no expectations. And in a fundamental way, the economy is not particularly, even though money plays a role, it's an exogenous factor. It's not part of the system. And he also accepts that you can use marginal theory about the future. But interestingly enough, that was still unacceptable to neoclassicals. ISLM gave them a way to absorb Keynes, but they were never happy with ISLM. Because for a start, one thing it argues is the government can change the level of output. If it does fiscal policy and moves the IS curve by changing the demand for goods and services, then it can change real output. And unemployment is therefore a policy variable. Okay, when you look at the, 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 the later arguments involving the Phillips curve, the level of unemployment could be changed by government policy. Now that is saying the market economy doesn't determine its own level of output. And that's not what neoclassicals like to say, because they like to argue that output is set by supply and demand, not set by a government action, and that money is neutral. Okay? Whereas in both versions, both of what Hicks called the classical school and what he called Keynes, money is non-neutral. So I think ultimately this leads to the rational expectations revolution in economics. And I think I might take advantage of the five minute and take a break there for 10 minutes, and we keep on going after that, okay? okay.